great honor. And uh, some of the, all the talk that we've heard said, tell us just a few stories you went on. As it, you would tell the history of my, my service. I went on 40, 42, come out 45, just, just about three years in. And uh, I was lucky, uh, when I went over, I went over from Camp Shanks out of New York City and loaded it on uh, Queen Mary. And uh, it was 17,000 on board. And that ship never had an escort, no nothing. They said, we can outrun any sub. You know, but how about a school of subs ahead of you? <laughs> 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 anyway, we made it. We made it across. Most of the time, it was taking 18 to 20 days in convoy to go across. We went across in five days. We landed in Scotland, went by train from Scotland to Reading, England, which is like 40 miles outside of London. Spent, uh, well, when I went in December of 43, 44, when I went in an invasion. But, and uh, <coughs> we're outside, you could stand up on the and see in London. And that night when they bombed that place, the whole place was lit up. And unfortunately, about a month there, we got a three-day pass. My buddy and I went into London. They caught us in the bucket brigade, <laughs> trying to put the fires on. <laughs> that that doesn't matter. After that, we just stayed away from London. There was no place to be. But from there, I went across uh, in June six on uh, D-Day uh, landing craft M3. It had about about around uh, 200 on board. You could see all night on the ship. We loaded at the end of the end of the day. And then when it was on in the morning, we were about the third or fourth wave going in. And we, the idea went in with the combat engineers, and they were supposed to maintain an airstrip on top, and there was like 12 or 14 hours of mechanics who were going to maintain the planes. They never materialized. They never got off the beach until the end of the day. And when they got off the end of the beach, it got dark, and so everybody stayed put where they were, along a hedge row, wherever it dug in for the night. And unfortunately, we ended up on a field right side where our there's a cow pasture there and a, uh, uh, a field where the cows placed at night. And why that farmer, he let his cows out at night, and of course, nobody moved. You just stayed where you were. There was any noise at all, and the machine got over. Uh, woke up in the morning, for every one of his cows were gone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, that, that was my experience there. And, uh, I was in the States. I was, went to AM school, aviation mechanic school, and I went to P-26 school. And when I was supposed to be uh, flying, what they call a flying crew chief, which was flight engineer now, I flew in the States, and uh, for some reason, when we got overseas, they broke the altitude up. After all our training together and practice flying along the West uh, Atlantic Ocean, they told us we uh, split the crew up. Well, my buddy and I said, the heck with that. We were going to a new crew. So <laughs> we signed up for another outfit that uh, the 83rd. And we went in with the invasion. With it, I was in uh, about 48. I was lucky. I saw most of Europe. I right? went all through France, Belgium, Holland, uh, Luxembourg. Luxembourg is a beautiful country. In the Belgium, just got out of the fast storm, the Battle of the Falls. And <laughs> on the beach, the boy and I, about four or five miles in, captured a German truck. <laughs> Try this. It had positive traction, a V8 with air cooled engine, and none of ours. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> it was a, a 12-volt system. And that thing would start, there were six by sixes and half traction, but when it got about 10 above zero, for good, you couldn't get them started, you had to jump and go on. And that, that truck always started, so we went and I painted an OD color, put our freight serial numbers on the side of it. <laughs> <laughs> and it over all over Europe. We used it as a parts truck. <laughs> but, uh, a great experience with that. But uh, then from that on, I went on to, uh, after I ended up in Luxembourg, for the Battle of Falls, waiting for that to break, when that broke through. I was attached to Patton's outfit, and I always had the Air Force patch on, and we always tried to maintain air strips between the infantry and artillery. Well, many times we'd get up in the front like that, and they thought we were guys, Air Force going back through. They were shot down. I could have went back to England half a dozen times. We stuck it out. And then uh, we went through, we got into about 40 or 50 miles of Berlin, and Patton didn't know what the heck was going really on in there, but at that time, they held us up for about three or four days long. He said, you guys aren't going to Berlin. The uh, Russians are going to take it. 
So Pat was really ticked. So he said, the heck with that. We went due south to Germany, ran into Lenz, Austria, and met the Russians there. <laughs> we couldn't, they're tough, we're tough guys. They've been through a lot, too. And uh, they, we couldn't get along with them. We get in the uh, bar, Jim go, and they get in a fight. So finally, the MPs come in, you go one night, they go the next night. You go the next night. <laughs> what we're doing there is tra transferring on C 47s. Uh, displaced personnel and forced labor. They were all down in that area, and they'd fly them as close as they could to their hometown. You know, up around Hamburg, uh, Luxembourg, Nuremberg, all through there. And finally, uh, that ended up, and then uh, we said, when it, the war was over, and, uh, by the end of uh, April or May, and we were, this is how it got to be August, we're still in the lens of Austria. So finally, he said, well, you gotta wait to be relieved. You guys, you guys can't go home. So they finally, they, relieve us, and I drove a, what they call a weapons carrier, which is a Dodge three-quarter ton, all the way from Lenz, Austria, all the way back through Germany, France, and down to Marseille, France, where they loaded our equipment aboard there. And we said, what's going to happen to us? Said, you guys are going to Japan. Uh, <laughs> I don't think so. They were waiting for a PTA to come. It didn't happen. And we were loading on a, a, a liner. All our equipment was loaded. And the, the night before we shipped out, PJ came. We go home. We pulled out the Sutuber Roller. And our schedule was still go to the Panama Canal, which my buddy and I said, This is it. We're jumping ship. <laughs> but he comes and says, What are you guys, what are we going? He says, You got the experience. Well, how do you think we got the experience? <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, it turned out we go through the Sutuber Roller and they come. Through the kind of piece and says, You guys are one of the first ships to go to New York City. And it was a uh, Swedish liner, it was about three quarters the size of Queen Mary. It was all by itself. We come to Queen Mary, come into New York City, now it's about three or four in the morning, everything goes dead. The engines go dead. And I said, you? Well, we got to wait the daylight to bring you guys into New York. Come on, we've been gone for two years. Let's get it on. They held us up till about eight o'clock and they brought us in. <coughs> of course, bands all over the Around us, and it said, from there I went to uh, Fort Dix. And then uh, <laughs> I got in the hassle of Fort Dix. I flew on beach 26 of the States, and there's always eight or ten on board. And we uh, always pull a deal that we fly from all over around in Nashville, Tennessee, to Omaha, Nebraska, and back for modification. We always had trouble hydraulic or something around Nashville, because that's a good city to stay in the night. <laughs> <laughs> it was all always for them, too. All, you know, they lived in the best hotel, ate the best chow, and said GI food. And, uh, so, naturally, we, the planes never locked, and I just shut the door and leave your equipment in it and take what you need to, for the night. Get back the next day, I always throw my chute on a, on a navigator's table. When you knew my chute was the one that disappeared. <laughs> and then, at that time, Shirt and suits were all silk. They weren't camouflaged yet. Yeah. So the guys were taking them and making uh, dresses or something for the ladies or night or, or something. <laughs> they pure silk. Well, uh, and that thing followed me all through Europe. And every once in a while, I go back to the rear echelon and they said, You owe us for a parachute. I don't know for a parachute. I said, I lost that in combat. Anything <laughs> <laughs> was expendable in when you're in combat. And you lose anything. It was expendable. Truck, uh, in fact, we lost a P-47. We had to sign a, a statement of charges for this thing, but we never did. But anyway, we ended up back there. But then the parachute followed me all the way right to Fort Dix. And all the guys around me are getting discharged. And I wonder what the heck's going on. So I went down to headquarters and find out and said, well, you owe for a parachute. <laughs> I owe for a parachute. And lucky it was the old master sergeant sitting at the table. I think Long was that in combat. Signed <laughs> <laughs> off on it. <laughs> so that's the way it ended up. Anyway, it was quite an experience. But uh, at my age, I wouldn't want to go through it again. <laughs> 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 <laughs>